Hello, hello folks. How are you all going? Hope you're all having a wonderful Global Hack Week so far. Hello, hello. Okay, okay, we're going to kick this off. I am going to be running this session a little bit differently from usual. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of... Uh, of old school learning before we uh, before we get into the real the real thick of things let's see if we can uh there we go. oh are we back i'm seeing some slightly unstable internet we'll we'll see if that holds up uh, we're gonna be doing a, a chunk let me just bring that music down uh, we're going to do a chunk of, of learning as a starting point. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to run you through a whole bunch of stuff related to hardware reverse engineering. We're going to talk about a bunch and like the the whole goal here, basically. Uh, like, hang on, the, uh, the the whole goal here basically is to build up a set of knowledge that we can then use to go on and implement in a future program so the the plan here basically is to sit down figure out the fundamentals we're gonna talk through a whole bunch of stuff related to that um, and then we're going to move on from there and we are going to then in the next couple of segments after this one we're going to go through and build ourselves a project from whole cloth and do a So, uh, what is hardware reverse engineering? Well, um, hardware reverse engineering is taking something like this calculator and digging all the way underneath the stuff that you get when you just normally turn it on and take a look at it to figure out exactly A, how it works, and B, what things are actually making it tick. There's a few different ways... example uh, like you can have forms of hardware reverse engineering like for example dumping firmware um, that is still fundamentally a form of hardware reverse engineering because it's related directly to the hardware even though you are still dealing with an environment where like fundamentally you're you're you're, you're still analyzing your software but that's co like colloquially considered to be a pretty common form of hardware reverse engineering in this context um, we also then have like straight up like we're going to take this thing we're going to put it on a bench we are going to put a dremel up against it and we are just going to tear the hell out of it we're going to get figure out exactly what the pcb is we're going to take a bunch of photos of the inside we're going to track back all of the individual pcb traces to figure out exactly what is going on at a at an uh, like electrical engineering level um, that is that is a form of, of hardware reverse engineering. Um, we've also got chip decapping, which is a very fun thing that we will be talking about in a bit, which is uh, basically where you use um, various forms of chemicals and solvents to basically take the plastic off of an integrated circuit. So like the little chips that you get, like the little black chips that you get on PCBs, you can melt the plastic off of those and then actually look at all the tiny little bond wires that are inside those integrated circuits to then figure out exactly how that circuit works. And that requires, actually it depends. Sometimes it requires specialized equipment. So Uh, for the purposes of MLH liability, do not recreate anything that I'm going to explain here at home. We are we are trained professionals on a closed circuit, so definitely don't try this. But there are there, like a lot of the to be around um, chip decapping is stuff that you can potentially do in a small lab, for example. Um, you you don't need like fancy scanning electron microscopes. Um, in most in some cases it depends on the chip you can get stuff that's really clumped together um transistor ratios and with uh 
um, from the folks that we have in chat, you have at some point um, either used or heard of um, the company Texas Instruments. They make the uh, the very veritable line of uh, TI-83 calculators. They also make a whole bunch of uh, other very, very fun ones. Um, this is one of the more fun ones. This is called the TI Inspire CX. Uh, this is basically an entire free Artos machine running in a calculator. It is, it is absolutely absurd. It was designed... I think originally for like very fancy scientific scientific computing, so it can do lots of fun stuff with like visualization and, and graphs and things. Uh, but the real fun with this is the fact that under the hood, this thing is basically an this is an entire computer. And if you can figure out how to reverse engineer the underlying part of this, we can then basically take what would normally be a relatively boring off the shelf calculator and get it to do some really fun stuff. So, um, here as an example, um, and we'll, we'll actually go and look at this in a second. Um, let me see if I can pull this tab up. Um, yes, so um, this is a the list of USB protocol events that this particular calculator supports. Uh, so this does a whole bunch of uh, various fun things. Um, it has individual. It has a whole set of underlying packet formats it has various services for doing a whole bunch of different things um, all of this has been quite wonderfully uh, documented on the ti inspire hacking wiki and all of it was acquired um, by reverse engineering the protocol itself mainly by uh, sniffing the usb packet data um, and looking to see what was actually going on under the scenes uh, so, let me see if testing one two. There we go. So this is the TI Inspire hacking wiki. So this has a whole bunch of various information in it. Um, we're going to focus mainly over here on. Um, The, for context, has not even been fully fully described yet. Like, there's still stuff that you could potentially go off and research if you really, really wanted to. Um, uh, the, the device name. This um, uh, that's a good question. The uh, it's a TI Inspire CX CAS. That one. Um, they 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 will run you about a hundred and fifty ish dollars, and um, they're 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 pretty um pretty uh pretty uneventful on that front. Um, so okay, let's take a quick look at the USB descriptors here. So we've got um. used for OS upgrades and it also isn't and um, okay USB descriptors right let's let's dig into a bit of hardware here so um how many folks um in well actually this is this, this, this is this is not even a question almost everybody in chat I imagine will at some point have used USB um what I imagine you may not have thought about is how it knows what the thing that you have magically plugged into your computer is um, and the answer to that question is called device descriptors. Uh, so the idea with USB basically is that you have two separate things that happen when you do a USB handshake. And this is standard across basically all USB devices. Firstly, it sends um, an identifier. So that is an identifier for what the product is. So it's name, um, usually also a, uh, a, a manufacturer ID, uh, which is a hard coded list. So if you want to get a, if you want to get yourself an ID, you have to go and pay a lot of money to the USB consortium, which uh, I do not like doing. Um, so uh, because I don't like doing that, there are also uh, certain USB IDs which are just sort of considered to be like free reign. So there's certain IDs which are designed where basically it's like if you're making a device and you don't much care about having a dedicated ID, then you can use this one. 
Um, there were all um, your configuration descriptors on what the device actually is. So you could have a configuration descriptor, for example, that says, hey, I am a mouse, and therefore it will know that, like, regardless of who built the mouse, and, rega and without having to install dedicated mouse software, as long as these two devices both speak, like, USB mouse protocols, then it should just work straight out of the box. And that's that's one of the, like, key fundamentals with USB, is, like, the whole... Like, the whole point of it is that there are, like, certain hard-coded things, like keyboards and mice and, um, like, certain forms of audio interface, uh, speakers, like, um, charging infrastructure, really big one. Like, these all have, like, fundamental, like, configuration descriptive standards. So, it doesn't matter what your thing does, it knows exactly... take a look at the uh, the USB protocol here, what we'll see um, is that we have a couple of things. We have a device descriptor here, we have an ID. Um, so we can clearly see that this has got a bit of information here. Um, and we can also see here, they've noted there's a few different USB IDs. So this is an EO H E12, uh, which um, I'm not sure exactly, this is a TI Inspire handheld. Uh, so we have, for example, like the E22 is the Inspire CX2. Um, it also has a couple of configuration attributes, so we can see that um, it has an attribute for the fact that it's bus powered. Uh, we have an attribute for the maximum amount of power that we should provide it. So this this matters a lot. Um, that it is it is very common um, that you can um, quite easily send too much power through a hardware device, and then it will let out the magic. Sp Uh, your stuff just doesn't work. So USB has solved for this by saying, hey, when you do the initial handshake, which you do on a very low amount of fixed power, which all devices are guaranteed to support, you don't like fire a thousand, like you, 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 don't, you don't fire six amps down the line initially. Uh, you give it just enough for it to talk to you. And then it tells you the maximum amount of power that it is willing to take. And then if you have good power management ICs, then... questions um what is the session plan uh we are going to be talking about reverse engineering with hardware we are not yet going to be building any projects we are laying down the fundamentals to do a little bit of uh hardware reverse engineering uh, in the next couple of sessions um yes i was at hack classic jet um so i don't doubt that you uh, you met me there um wonderful okay um Wanted to strip this down to do some reverse engineering. Okay, Casio FX. Uh, let's have a look at this. 991 ES Plus. So this. Okay, this is this is a slightly older scientific. Right. Uh, oh, I no, I've I. I... I'm not sure how much we could potentially get away with with that one. I think I, I, the, the, the there's definitely stuff you could do with that. The difficulty with those kinds of integrated calculators is um, specifically the fact that a lot of them nowadays, on account of pricing, tend to be single IC designs, which basically means that all of the all of the logic and the hardware and everything is pretty much baked into the the design of the chip itself. So it's usually rare that calculators in that price point have um, chipsets that are that will allow you to update them because they're designed basically to just be like flashed. Well, not even flashed. They're usually just like manufactured with the firmware built in um, and then shipped out and off you go. Uh, so as a general rule, that 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 might not be the greatest place to start I mean, you can absolutely have a go at it um i i definitely recommend that you uh, see if you could um 
start by tearing it down and uh, taking some photos of the PCB and starting to trace out where all of the all the traces go. That's always a great starting point. Um, does this mean if we can send these hard-coded values to another USB device, it might recognize it as a mouse or keyboard? Yes, that is absolutely correct. And that is also how a very common... Oh, this is a great segue. This is how a very common um, security uh, device called the USB rubber ducky works. Um, so you might have heard of this. It's a little USB device. Uh, and what it allows you to do is you can program it with a bunch of code so that it will, um, when you plug it in to a, it looks like a USB drive, but when you plug it into someone's computer, it can act as a keyboard and mouse and then automatically do keyboard and mouse actions. So it can like, go in and like use the use the mouse you, you create a fake mouse and then use that fake mouse to then um like copy all of your files onto it um as an example so yeah so that is that is exactly how usb rubber ducky works is that it, it says hey then gets to just act like all three um and, and and the system just doesn't care it's like yeah you have the right but yep you you have these configuration descriptors and i'm sending you commands and you're responding with the right commands so i just don't care like it it it, it does not mind the fact that um like this this one device is doing like 10 different things um I think you actually I think it might mind if one device had that with multiple descriptors. Generally I think the way it works is that it fakes a it fakes the descriptor for a USB hub and then it and then the USB hub responds with, Oh yeah, no, I have three separate devices connected to me and then it just automatically like routes the uh the, the data based on what device it thinks it's talking to at that point. Um hopefully that answers that question. Okay. okay, so we, we've talked a little bit through USB here. Um, if we go a little bit further down into this page, we start to see a bit more stuff on engineered from the USB packet data. Uh, and we can start to see a, a, a few patterns which are quite helpful when it comes to reverse engineering, um, especially when you're reverse engineering packet data, because there's a lot of fun stuff that comes with that that you don't always get in other contexts. Um, so as an example here, uh, if we look at the actual packet format, um, the first thing that it starts with is a constant. Um, and this, this is usually a pretty common thing. If, you, if, if you're analyzing packet data in the wild, especially packet data that's being sent between two hardware devices, always, 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 like, 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 like at first you get a whole bunch of it, like get, get as many, like, 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 like record as much data as you possibly can do. But then put it all side by side and like start looking for patterns in it. Like run it through a run it through a diff tool. Uh, see what see what matches up and what doesn't. Because there will probably be, and it's usually the first two or two to four bytes or potentially something a little further in, there will be a fixed constant value, which is like, hey, the which is usually like the hey, I am this kind of packet like identifier. Um, in this case, we have 54FD as our like starting constant, um, and then immediately after that, we have four bytes dedicated to our source address, and four bytes dedicated to our destination address, um, and then also some stuff for service ID. Um, same four bytes again. So what that provides us with um, is we can then is we can then we can then similarly if we diff it and we see, hey, these two values. Is keep changing around depending on whether the data is coming from the computer. So we could reasonably infer at that point, with like a relative degree of confidence, that the like the data that, that like the whole reason why that's switching might be because of other things. But if it's that consistent, there is a pretty good chance that it's because the direction of data flow is changing. Um, okay, so there's a couple other things here. There's a checksum. Um, on the data segment, um, and we can see here that the uh, is that. Hang on, DC. 
Yeah, there's a checksum. So it's so it's a fixed two byte checksum for the data part. So that that's fine because that means that the rest of the length won't change, which is why it's earlier in the sequence. Um, and then we have the size of the data part, which is also two bytes. Uh, which which again, yeah, the fact that it's two bytes that tells us a few things. It tells us that the, for example, that let probably with. But in, in all in all reasonableness, though this again might be something that you you would want to test any larger than the maximum value of a two byte number. Like that is that is useful information to know because it means we can start to set these we can start to set these limitations down pretty early. Um, so we then have uh, data part itself. Uh, a little ACK segment, which is used for acknowledging packets, um, a sequence number, and a another checksum, which is always fun. Um, we have some service identifiers. Uh, so if we go down here, we can see all of the different types of service which are loaded onto the thing. Uh, we have some stuff on sequence numbers, some stuff on acknowledgement. Um, but let's let's actually go and take a look. We'll we'll talk about the USB protocol a little bit later. But what we are going to start off with here is I want to I want to take a brief look at the hardware, because um, there is some uh, some nice stuff in here. So if we look, at... yeah, here we go. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's take a look at this. So this this is the the back of said PCB. Uh, this is this is the back of one of these calculators. And immediately we could we can start to pick apart a few things, right? So um, there is some. Okay. Actually, let, let's. I'm I'm going to throw this to chat. What is uh, for you folks watching? What what are the things that you that immediately come to mind? Um, as, as stuff that is like relevant for hardware reverse engineering when we look at this at uh, this photo like we've just we've just opened this thing up what are the immediate thoughts there's some there's some fairly self evident stuff here that i think there's also some more interesting things i'm, I'm also i also immediately taken by the fact that the uh like this this this, this is un entirely unrelated but I, i'm just so thrown by the fact that best be what for this is on the that is unhinged design absolutely un absolutely off the wall um yep okay ports yeah absolutely so we have we have what looks um like usb up here uh, might not be. It has five pins. It's a slightly weird shape. I think I think it's USB, but it also might potentially be. Um, well, it might look, might be USB Type B actually. Um, maybe. Um, similarly, at the bottom here, we have uh, we have a whole a whole section here um, with a, a little cutout in the in the bottom of the board, which looks for the world as if something can. We have two ribbon cables, uh, which are both streaming in, and then uh, both of these. If, if we if we look at where the traces are going, and we follow all of these around, a we have a couple of traces that are going off to this um, ribbon cable here, but then almost everything else all goes down, all goes down into this giant ribbon into this big ribbon little holes here these are through hole connections in your pcb boards so this means that this is this isn't just like disappearing it's going to the other side or if it's a multi-layer board it's going to some layer inside the board uh which is fun and um, 
what I think are top of here. We have um, a couple of resistors here and there. We have a few more capacitors. We have some a uh, couple of some little transistors here, or possibly diodes. Uh, we have a chip, um, and in fact, we uh, we have a, a chip with an identifier on top of it, which is uh, LP three two four M. And the other thing that you can do when reverse engineering hardware a lot is that you can uh, you can just Google stuff. Um, and what we discover when we Google LP three two four M is that we actually get uh, a page. There we go. We actually get age for a Texas Instruments chip, um, an LP324M um, micro power quad op amp. So, again, makes sense. It's a Texas it's a Texas Instruments device. It would stand to reason that they are using Texas Instruments chips. So we can be pretty confident at this point that that is probably the right identification for it. Um, so. We've got a whole segment here that is dealing with a bunch of plot. Really unrelated to everything else because a lot of these connections through are coming from beers. Uh, but also that a lot of it seems to be dealing with just this USB port at the top. So there's like a good, a good, there's a pretty good rough idea here that like we're not going to be dealing with a lot of. River Gable. And for what it's worth, these, we, we can also make a pretty educated guess based on where this is located, that either these two ribbon cables or this ribbon cable on the side, um, and I have, my, I have a sneaking suspicion that the one on the side is actually the display here rather than the ones on top uh, for reasons that I will explain momentarily. Um, but we can basically we can be pretty well sure that like these two ribbon cables are nothing to do with anything going on here they are being just passed straight down over into this fun pcb um we have a little bridging pcb here um so this is like a thing because it's cheap um, you is it like if you need to fit like a strange case shape for example you will design two pcbs like as we have here in fact we have one above it you will be doing most of the processing so we've got like a whole like layered board thing going on here and as part of that we've got this little um this little linker uh, like this is a linking ribbon cable uh, so this is a flexible ribbon cable uh, that is connecting these two fixed uh, pcbs so these aren't flexible these are just like hard fr4 material um, but we can also note here that um okay there's a few again there's a few very interesting things that are going on with this board um in fact there's there's actually five or six, and I'm, I'm quite excited to uh, to start digging into these. So, um, if we start from the bottom here, um, firstly we have this little connector, which is uh, good if you're if you're looking for uh, exposed copper connections. You can usually pretty reasonably infer that that's going to be a, a connector of some sort. Um, if we head on slightly further up, um, there's a few things that immediately jump out to me. Uh, the first of which is this little thing here so this is like one two three four five six seven eight like 10 pins in a little cluster um, and this is exposed copper like little round sections um this this looks for all the world to be like a programming header um more like in fact in fact this looks like a very specific kind of programming header um for a a uh, for a, a piece of programming hardware that has escaped the name of me right now, but it's like a very lovely tiny little pen with a bunch of pogo pins at the bottom of it. Um, and what this allows us to do, among other things, is that... Hmm. 
CPU of this device. So this thing gives us um, this thing gives us all kinds of um, fun opportunities to then start to go. Hey, well, if I let's see, like if I trace this this one out, this is going to like the five volt line. Yeah, so it's a a term in like PCB design. It's it's used for a couple of different things. Um, it can be used to describe like raised segments of pins. Um, so you might you might have seen on like a last. Those are commonly referred to as pin headers. Um, so that's a fairly common uh, term there. In this context, I'm talking specifically about this section at the bottom here, um, which is a section of the PCB where they have taken um, individual, like, there's then a header that something else can then come on to an interface with. So if you have a, a, a something uh, like a, a bit of, bit of uh, plastic with a little set of pogo pins in it you can then slide this up and in and you can then have it interface directly with each one of those couple lines we also uh, which is very fun here if we take a look at some of these individual details we have um, a lot more little copper dots here that are all marked with um, this little number next to them on the silk screen uh, if we can see here we have like TP70, TP74, TP72, um, TP73 over here. Um, and there might be, like, like, the immediate question a lot of people will go, like, okay, well, yeah, it's like, there's, there's, there's a bunch of things on here. Why should I, why should I care about them? Well, these are test points. That's what an acronym, that's an acronym, that's a new name, new word even. That's what that acronym stands for. Those is again and solder a tiny wire to them or trace them out and um, so you can like even follow follow each one of these uh, and it takes a little while but you can do it follow it all the way back to wherever it's going and then you know that hey okay this is this is going specifically to this chip over here or it's going to do this thing or it's going over to this um, and what that then allows you to do is instead of like like a common thing you you might have to do at some point especially if you're reverse engineering stuff that doesn't have exposed test points is to very gently you could you could scrape away the top layer of the solder mask um, and then what that and then that will then expose the copper that you can then solder onto so there's an element there of like the on the let's let's see if this maybe makes the uh i've just moved wi-fi network so we'll see if that improves the uh the fun internet issue that it looks like we're experiencing um if there happens to be continuing issues just do let me know and i'll, I'll take a look at it uh but yeah as, as an example we have like yeah you know, like we can we can solder directly onto those points um, and that will then improve our that will improve our prospects dramatically the other thing to be aware of here as well um, as an example is that around these screws you can see this big round circle of copper uh, this is specifically so that the screw is grounded so the idea is that the screw is directly connected to the ground of the ground plane of the rest of the device so that you can't get yourself like accidentally shocked by the screw which is always a good thing uh, we can see up here like this this is tons of test points like there is there is a test point probably for almost every single 
section of this board even like every every pin will probably have a test point somewhere or another really good thing to uh, to leverage okay so over here uh, we've got a couple of things on this side we have a uh, crystal oscillator just down here um, then a couple of other chips um, a few other fun things that looks like a Phillips power I see um, what I'm looking for up here is this copy. Um, can anybody can anybody tell me what this is? I am I am looking for a specific term here. So if we're uh, if we're feeling lucky today, we might we might find it. That could be fun. Any guesses? Okay, we will, uh, the glue gun part, yeah. Um, close. No, this, uh, this is a bodge wire. <laughs> This is this is my favorite part sometimes of, of opening up a piece of, uh, of of hardware because you will find so quickly that what what will what will end up happening and this is this is really common is that you will you will have a p a piece of hardware and it will have gone through all kinds of incredible fun vigorous testing or it might not have done um, and what ends up happening is that you. Like right before you, like, like as soon as you've gone and manufactured all of your PCBs, you go, oh, this bit here is broken and it actually needs to be connected over here. And so you have two options. You could either refabricate all of your PCBs, which if you've already fabricated, if you've already made like a hundred thousand PCBs, that is a lot of money. That is, that is not a thing that a lot of places are likely to do unless you're like Apple. Um, what they will do instead, in a lot of cases, is in instead of like having to like make a whole new PCB and like wasting all of the existing PCBs and everything, they will um, they will take uh, a little a little wire and they will uh, they'll just solder it uh, between those two points, um, and then usually you'll get a little dab of hot glue in there, uh, which is basically there to uh, to keep everything from to stop it from moving around. So if it gets bumped or something something happens to it, it's not going to go walkies. Um, this is really common. It's also really fun when you open a piece of hardware that has these because it usually means that you... Um, how would I put this? It, it usually means that, you, that, you're, that you're going into something that has had like... I mean, A, it's just kind of cool that it's been like hands reworked. So like that's always a, always a fun little detail for me at least. But the thing that's usually more interesting is... If you actually look at the PCB design, you might be able to figure out why they've done it. Like there's, like there's usually a thing of like, hey, like this chip over here that's bridged to this chip, like the, the the two lines on these are both chip select. So I guess that means that this chip didn't have chip select correctly routed on the board. And then you go and uh, you go and trace the uh, the PCB trace right back around, and you go, oh yeah, no, actually, that did not have um, I did not have that attached at all, which is uh, which is a really bad thing. Um, so there, there's definitely an element to that um, and then similarly over here you see these big big square pads um, these are again both both grinding pads um, or potentially actually RF um, stuff there's, there's a distinct possibility that these might be RF related um, there's also a little cutout here um, I'm not sure whether that is specifically so that you can see, or um, so that you so you can see the display behind it, or potentially to allow light to filter through. Though I'm not sure why you would do that. Um, it also might just be for ease of like, for either decreasing weight or just for ease of fitment that they can actually get behind it. Uh, that's always that's always an option with these things. Um, oh, and then the most obvious thing right at the top, which I completely forgot about, is. Uh, this um uh, this little this little segment here um this uh, usually 
on most PCBs, there will be a silk screen marking, uh, or in some cases, a lot of silk screen markings. And no silk screen marking is more important than the one that the manufacturer puts on to identify the board, because it is a treasure trove of information. So in, that case, in this case, this one says PH1. Okay, not quite sure what that is. PBT. Okay, so this is an acronym. Uh, this stands for product validation testing. So this means that like this version of the PCB, uh, this showed up at some point during the product validation testing cycle, which is usually like the second to last step before you actually get something out to market. So that's usually a pretty, pretty late in the game, I'd say. Um, LCDB. Um, okay, this is um, this is apparently um, potentially a the a, the revision for a a B version of the LCD. Um, th this could also be a common thing that you get with a lot of hardware is that you will have uh, situations where, like for example, uh, like like a specific part, for example, screens. Is a because that's exactly what we've got here. Like. It might be that you have you, you've got a great deal with this PCB manufacturer, and then and they're making you like fifty thousand PCBs, but they can only make you fifty thousand PCBs. And if you need to sell a hundred thousand calculators, then you might need to go to like PCB guy's friend down the road and be like, "Hey, I want I want fifty thousand of your of your best PCBs." At which point, they'll come back to you and say, "Yeah, you can have them, but like it's a different like layout. Like we're 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 we're, we're like clocking." chip select or something like there's there's some some fluff going on um and the solution to this is really quite simple it is to um basically just go through and design like two versions of the board um and actually now that now now that i say that this actually now makes complete sense as to why these are two separate isolated boards joined with a ribbon kit um it's probably not because they were trying to figure out what shape to fit it in it is probably because this top board is exclusively dealing with the LCD connection over here and then routing it down into a standardized layout for this board to then pick up. So what this means effectively is that that top board could be swapped out for any PCB that they want so long as that PCB routes all of the, all of the correct pins to the correct pinout for this board. So it gives you a lot more flexibility um, when you're doing manufacturing because it means that effectively you lose that need to like lock everything in early uh, because you can go, hey, well, yeah, like all of my, all of my really expensive like core fundamentals are, are done, but now I need this other thing. Um, and that matters as well in the context of like manufacturing, right? Like, if you're if you're really happy with this board and you and you're like okay well this board this board over here is perfect um but you, you don't want to like spend all of the time that you could have spent fixing other things on like waiting like like you're just sitting there with your hands done waiting until this board is now, now this board is done now you need to build this board attached to it because you can't actually manufacture any of this board until you finished all the design on this. So like the fact that you can take all of that away and basically go, hey, yeah, like this is this is the PC L C D board and therefore done. Like like that is that is fully decoupled effectively from, from the board below it, which means that you end up with this wonderful situation where the board below it is functionally isolated. Um, and it, it can be it can be worked on in complete independence. There is no um, there's no fundamentals there um, in terms of like material, so that that solves all of our problems there. Um, and it, it 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 it's just really nice. It just like it solves all kinds of uh, all kinds of fun little details. Um, Especially when it comes to design for manufacturing, uh, this is like, like this is like honestly, there's, there's whole segments of this that I like. I could do a whole thing just on, like the design of this plastic case because there are so many little features in here. Like all of these little sections in here to both like both hold like this this bit for example, like where it's both holding the PCB in, but is also designed with that perfect little screw 
um height segment or like this pocketing um or the fact that like this thing here doubles as a clip but was also probably the injection mold like push off um when this whole thing was was made as a single part like there's oh it's so good it's so good so if we if we as, as an example then if we then take that uh and we can see here actually that there are there are different uh, oh actually no there we go variant pvt cast so we were right so if, if we look then at a like later in the build we see okay well firstly we see that our pvt label is gone this is now n1 n3 um we also see that like the design we see the design of this top section has changed quite a bit there is in, fa in fact a lot of these are cost savings so if we look like we we see that for like, like as an example here we see that 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 entire uh like that full weight op amp this this bit here and almost all of these uh, capacitors they are now completely gone that four way op amp is completely gone um all of that stuff is, is the on, on, on a on a device that is being mass manufactured to this level those are seriously big benefits like there is there is a lot of money in that um if we also look at it we can we can also then see again down here this bottom board has has again completely changed layout there were there were like there's lots less of this stuff it look it looks like some of these uh a lot of these smaller chips here for example like all of this integrated logic might well have been condensed into some bespoke chips which are now being used here uh we have a again uh still got a crystal but a much smaller crystal this is this is like a little baby crystal this is a this is a chunky we can hand solder this big boy crystal it also has some sharpie markings on the boards and this is usually this is usually indicative of some form of quality control testing um not always but but can be um and in a lot of cases what you're mainly looking at here is like if it's just been like ticked you know like it's it, like it's good then that's fine but like if they've actually provided some notes on the device itself that can be very very helpful potentially um we also now have um instead of this uh instead of this ribbon being exclusively uh locked in on the basis of these two bits uh, we instead have it being secured on both sides by yeah there's still a screw here and there's still a couple of other bits but mainly this is being secured by four blobs of solder on both sides uh, and this whole this whole mechanism has also been 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 reshuffled the cutout stays uh, but the difference now is that um all of that wonderful like like all, all of that stuff that was probably running on the other side of this board in fact actually this might that might be the difference it might be that they've inverted the direction of this board that it actually got flipped um because i was gonna say like this like for all intents and purposes this does kind of look as if they what they've done is that they flipped the board because everything else lines up um we've also down here a little bit more sleuthing work we have a what looks like a missing ic and we know it's not missing because this is like a validation version from way down the line so we know this we know this works the fun question here um uh, which tends to uh, to end up with a few different answers is was this removed because it was strictly unnecessary for what they were doing is this a chip that is only uh, populated during specific um like for specific models is this like a like a fancy like like multivariant like regression calculating thing in which case it probably then ha does have it um or is it just a thing where it like it used to be necessary and then at some point 
they're like updated some fun over here and tweak some stuff over there and suddenly it's just no longer relevant but there's no point in reworking the entire board design because the only thing that you've changed is the software and the chips so you just keep the board exactly as it is and just keep churning out more of them just without that chip attached um we can also see some more um Yeah, our whole fiber class. And so we can see that that's clearly working. Um, and then there's a couple of other things here. There's a, uh, there's what looks like a tiny button, uh, which is interesting. Um, I have an immediate gut instinct as to what that does, but I don't think that it does what I think it does in this context, uh, which is always fun. Okay, so if we... Uh, if we take a look at like an A variant TI Inspire, uh, or specifically the cast, like the first gen cast, um, and, and immediately this is again a pretty similar, pretty similar layout, but now that we flip this board around, we can see a couple of different things. Firstly, this stuff is all is all covered over um, and, and has a much thicker layer of copper around it um, and what that means among many other things um is that they're looking specifically here for like rf shielding like usually usually when you see a pcb that has like a massive ring of copper around it it's grounded copper it usually means that they're trying to deal with like signal interference um and again here we go so we have like the front side of the pcb itself so we have a in this model, at least, they changed this later down the line. We'll take a look at those in a minute. Um, it's like a grayscale LCD display um, and an ARM 9 based 32 bit risk processor. And, and we'll see here that, like, it, it's actually it is branded. It says it says TI Inspire on it, but it's been designed by. Uh, Yes, yeah, so again, they're, they're saying here, like, hey, it's, it's this specific thing. Um, and what this gives us is, is, like, the ability to go, hey, yeah, no, this is, like, there's a pretty good guess that if it's this ZBO chip that we're using, we've got a 90 megahertz R9 in there, which is, which is not nothing. Like, for, for a system with a, with a grayscale LCD, they really did go heavy on the pro. Um, We've also got a few different memory chips. We've got a 32 uh, megabyte NAND flash um, and 16 megs of SD RAM. Um, and the SOC is, is, I think, despite the fact that it can do 90 megahertz, it looks like they're clocking it at 27, uh, which which is kind of weird. Like that is that is kneecapping this thing's performance like dramatically. Um, and now we have again we have like three three separate display drivers. Um, so right at the top, uh, this one, I assume, maybe, maybe not. I, th I, th I wonder if there might be this one, the one that's missing, um, or it might be this chip, but I don't think it's that chip, but like, yeah, so it has like the ability to basically feed stuff as it goes, which is, which is kind of interesting. Um, so if I let me take a look briefly, so what I would like to do is uh, we're going to jump back for a second, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit of my uh, of my approach that I took to uh, to reverse engineering this particular piece of kit, which was really rather rather fun, if, if I do say so myself. So um, the actual goal of this project, which I should probably have like made relatively clear up front. The idea was that we, what we wanted to do was to take communicate. We, we wanted to do the, 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 the fun, laughable goal of running serverless computing on a graphic calculator. So the idea is basically that you would figure out a way to communicate between gra graphing calculator and computer. You would then set the graphing calculator up with an application that could run some kind of code. And then you would 
send the code, you would invoke the code from your computer, and then it would do the processing on the calculator itself, and it would then bring all of that stuff back to you. It'd be great and fun and wonderful, and everybody would be happy. Um, so step one of that process, um, other than acquiring the calculators, which was a bit of an experience on itself, was to start looking at those USB protocols. Uh, and we found a few different interesting things. Was the, um, the way that it handled file transfers. Because I was very acutely aware of the fact that like, if I was going to run any server stuff on there, and like a lot of the payloads are going to end up being files, I wanted to know like, hey, how is this thing going to handle files? Um, and if you, if you look in the bottom right here, you will you will see that it does not handle files particularly well. Um, in fact, more specifically, um, it is currently it is transferring a file to itself at a rate of 270 kilobytes. Um, and that's actually a technical limitation based on the protocol that we discussed before. Because as you can remember, the actual length for how long your data packet can be can't be any longer than a number that is encoded as two bytes. Uh, so what that means in practice is that you can't send any more than 254 bytes at a time which is really bad because it means that you end up basically kneecapping your file transfer capabilities because you couldn't be bothered to add an extra two sets of digits, which is just absolutely unheard. That is, that is, that is just absurd. Like <laughs> very, very odd. Um, but you can see that it does work. There is, there is file transfer stuff going on, um, which is ticking on and, uh, yeah. So, I, we're, I'm going to take a quick break because I've been talking for pretty much an hour nonstop. Um, I'm going to take a break to grab some water. You should also take a break to grab some water. If you have not already, please do make sure that you stay hydrated during Global Hack Week. Um, I will be back in approximately five minutes and we are going to continue uh, talking through this project.
Ah, uh, but alright, folks. How are we all doing? Hopefully, everybody's had a chance to uh, grab themselves a little something. Let's shuffle this around and we'll get back to it. Wonderful. Okay, so we've got ourselves our wonderful ability to transfer files, which is always excellent. And yet, we still don't quite have the methods that we need to uh, to put the cherry on the um, on the cake, as it were. Uh, in terms of getting our wonderful little projects off the ground. So, step two after this um, is to take a look at, well, the associated stuff that's around, because another big thing with hardware reverse engineering is that in a lot of cases, if you're trying to work with a piece of hardware, there's a pretty good chance that you, like, if it's a relatively well-known thing, there's a pretty good chance that you're probably not the first person to have come across it. And the good news is that in a lot of cases that is the case. I mean, it means that you end up with wonderful situations like this, where you go, hey, has anybody else been building stuff for this calculator? And then it turns out that there's not only um, not only if people have been building stuff for this calculator, but there's an entire emulator and a whole SDK that you can use to build stuff for the calculator. And so you go off and you install that. And it's called MDLer. If anyone wants to it, it's really good. Um, and step one uh, of any good hardware version, you know, if it has a screen, you have to run Doom on it. That is, I, I, I didn't make the rules, that's just sort of the way it is. Um, so, one of the first things that I did with mine, which uh, I've got a little bit of a video here that I managed to dig out, uh, this, is, this is me loading up a, a port of Doom uh, specifically for. The the TI eighty uh, the TI Inspire CX. <laughs> this this might be one of the most uh, one of the funniest things I've ever done. There's, there's something there was something so beautifully stupid about playing Doom on a calculator. Like there's yeah, um, surprisingly it does actually play really well. Um, the, the, the 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 for some reason the section in the middle of this thing. Uh, on the Inspires is like a fully functional multi-touch pad. So the actual controls, uh, like the actual control surfaces for a calculator, it is great for first-person shooters. Like that is that is absurd. Uh, so after we don't have to play around with that, um, and also Mario, because why not? Um, We'll do a little, little quick load in for the uh, for the GBA emulator. This is an example of what you really can do with these because they are so powerful. Like it's it's absolutely absurd the level of that you can get out of these puppies. It is it is just it is quite something, uh, and I love it. It's it's so cool. It just it just pops, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm heading in on here to, uh, to play myself with a bit of Luigi. Uh, and yeah, this is, well, obviously this is a good plan, but we uh, we have a few other things that we can get to. And um, so if we head on over into the, uh, into some of the code, uh, and this is, this is starting to dig a little bit into the, uh, into the actual SDK itself. Uh, but there's a, there's a call for example here. So if we, if we take a look at how it's actually communicating, um, We've got an example here for the um, the device input command, and it does a couple of different things. It uh, sets up a few buffers. Uh, it sets the service connect. So the th the things that really matter here is these three, uh, these three seconds here. Um, we have this service connect function, which takes uh, what appears to be 
a handle to an existing connected Inspire device. Uh, it also takes an ID, which I'm, which I'm going to guess is a service ID. Uh, and then uh, we have this like return. Uh, and like if it fails, then it returns it back. Um, we then proceed to, I don't know why it keeps jumping to our slide. Um, we then proceed to like pa take the same handle we've like, we've connected to the service. We then write a single byte of data, and then we read two hundred and fifty three bytes of data. Um, we then do some mem move stuff to align that buffer correctly, um, and then we do some some stuff basically to uh, to pull things out of this buffer and into this device info struct uh, and then do another couple of things what really matters is we have the ability to create a service we have the ability to write and read from that service um, so that then gives us the ability to start pushing data back and forth to and from the calculator over usb uh, so we, we now understand like the fundamentals of like okay we have this protocol this stuff is working flawlessly this is all happy, so we're we're, we're good. We've got we've got all of our component pieces here. This is this is excellent. Um, and when you start doing that, one of the first things that you want to do is start taking a look at, especially if you're doing stuff with USB devices, you want to be able to look at what you're actually sending over the wire. Um, and the good news is that there's a lot of ways to do that nowadays in the modern era. Um, Wireshark is really good at this because it has lots of functionality where you can basically just like load it up on your laptop and it can then immediately start like packet capturing all of the usb on that laptop um that is probably the biggest approach i'd say you can take with these things is to then um, it's it, like, like there's, there's a lot of really good tooling out there for analysis um and for what it's worth i think the more time that you spend actually looking at like the underlying like Okay, well, I poke this thing and it does this. That's usually to me is, is like the, in a lot of cases, it's the fastest way to. Uh, it's the fastest way to get things moving, definitely. Um, so, if we head on over, we uh, we run up a little bit of code ourselves. Uh, we do a few things. We uh, we we connect up to uh, to our own serverless remote server. Um, we try and initiate and socket. We, we connect into ours, and then we uh, we wait until the uh, until the like as long as we haven't had the escape key pressed. And if it, we press the escape key, then we just dump out. Basically, we had a stop, we return. It, it goes all over. Uh, we I, I still don't know, by the way, why this ns get packet size command is a thing because the packet size is a fixed static value so like this is never going to be different i guess i guess if one of the different calculator versions has a different larger packet size or maybe a smaller one um i'd have to look into that actually i, I, I wonder whether they increased it in, in later versions of the protocol um but yeah so basically while while we don't have escape pressed we uh, we set up a buffer and we read all of our data into that buffer and then at this point in the code, we were literally just like, yeah, I'm just going to dump the buffer. Like, we just dump it into a message box and see what happens. Um, but a little while later, it got to a point where um, I had it where you could basically, I've got little Python files, like push stuff out over serial. Uh, and it's got this little serverless program running on it. And what we do is we basically load up the... Uh, load up necessary information we upload a little python file and uh, we send it over and this and the uh, we have a, a micro python interpreter now built in to the calculator so that then now gives us the ability to then go hey i'll run this command uh, and i want you to invoke the code you have currently loaded with these arguments um, and it does the calculation and it returns it to us so uh, as, as this is this is going all the way from like hey i've got a calculator to i can now run arbitrary code on this calculator and i can send code to this calculator and i can receive code from this calculator and all of those pieces just like just like that it's all come together um 
Okay, before I jump into more fun reverse engineering things, do we have any questions on any of the stuff that I've explained so far? I'm aware that I'm like firing through a lot of concepts really quickly here because I, I do want to get to uh, the plan. The plan is that for the, uh, for the next couple of sessions that we've got over the weekend, uh, we're going to actually sit down and do each of this practically. But in order for us to make the most of our time, I want to spend this time basically laying down the laying down six, getting getting all the good stuff in there. I'll give it a little little while for any uh, for any questions to drop in. All right, let's. Cool. Looks like we're relatively quiet on that front, so I will. Uh, I'll move on to the next bit. Um. Let me. Uh, let me just take a quick look at a couple of things here. Oh, okay, cool. That works. Sweet. Okay. Okay. Booth to CDFs. Um, <laughs> I should learn this stuff by breaking stuff. I, I, it's, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, practicing. Practicing hardware reverse engineering. Um, ah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good YouTube content for this. Uh, the The best thing that I can recommend is that like I tend to watch a lot of YouTube content on this because I find that's a really good way to like learn a lot of the like to like really embed a lot of the concepts around what's going on. But also, there's a lot of really well-written Hacker Day articles that tend to go into detail with a lot of this stuff. Um, that that tends to be a really good place to start for like just embedding the knowledge without necessarily having to like spend all of your time tearing stuff down twenty-four-seven. Cool. Okay. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna move on uh, very briefly. We're gonna we're gonna talk about another another little project of uh, of mine from a little while ago. Uh, this is a company called Recon Instruments. Um, they do really fun stuff, um, or they, they they did really fun stuff. I should say they are they are very much aware at this point, which uh, which is lately. Actually, no, no, it's very sad. It's um, it's a real it's a real kicker because it was it was one of the arguably one of if not the most innovative companies i'd say in like the mid like you know actually no, the very early 2010s um like i like really 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 fancy stuff um so what they were doing specifically um recon's whole 
whole bit was basically that they uh, there you go, there's that um, based out of Canada, a relatively small startup bought by Intel um, way way back in the day. We're, we're making heads up displays, uh, specifically heads up displays for sports. So we're talking um, like heads up displays for like skiing or um, snowboarding or cycling or swimming, like like all that kind of jazz. Um, and they came out with a consumer heads up display for all of this about two years before Google Glass was ever a thing. So they were these the, like these folks were really ahead of the curve. Um, they, they, this, this is a photo of the jet, which is their, um, this is their bicycle heads up display, which is really quite a cool design. Um, they did ski goggles, like I said, um, like really, again, really nice stuff. Like it was, it was smart, smart engineering. Um, and it worked. It was like these, these tiny little optical arrays, and like this little, little form factor and it, it slid into the goggles and it was great. It's good stuff. Um. And it would give you this little readout in the uh, in the bottom in the bottom right. It would go like, "Hey, is the is, is the thing you're trying to do? Here's the uh, here's all of the stuff." Um, and then they get acquired by Intel, um, roughly around 2016, 17, uh, and they do some stuff uh, very briefly. They they do some some integrations with like commercial folks, and they, they sort of go down the pipeline that like Google Glass ended up doing with like glass enterprise um but but in the end they 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 just quietly like sunset them which which i i personally think is really really sad um like there's like there's, there's a lot of things that you can um like there's a lot there's a lot of there really is still a, again a lot of stuff that you can like do with these um and like ultimately, yeah, that's just it, it's it's just it was just really good hardware. It was it was like like really really good stuff, um, and I and I liked it. And it was uh, it was really solid. Um, but like I say, it went the way of the dodo. And uh, and one of the things that you do when you have something that goes the way of the dodo. Um, well, among many other things, um, one of the things that you can do with it uh, is to go, hey, um, we're going to this, and we're going to Back to the Dead, which is what you do, especially with the with hardware. Like one of the biggest things for me with being able to reverse engineer stuff is one of. Right, so we will uh, we'll continue very briefly. Um, yeah, like one of the things I really love about hardware reverse engineering, especially, is the ability to bring stuff back from the dead. Um, so they shutter this thing, it disappears off, um, and I'm sort of like, well, how hard can it be? Like we can. So I spend a whole bunch of time like digging out um, different versions of these of these goggles. I like I, I go just all over the place um, like i find a, uh, i find a couple of them on ebay uh, i find a guy on twitter who's willing to uh, to sell me one um, and i find this this listing here which was uh, i think uh, some folks in the in like canada that had it and it was like it was a whole thing so i'm i've got i've got my hands on some uh, so it's like okay right, well let's we just dig into some some of the firmware here um, and one of the things you very quickly figure out once you uh, once you dig out the uh, the specific details of the the underlying chipset uh, is that this is a uh, OMAP board. Um, it, like the, it, it's it's noted on the board itself, but it's also very evident in the firmware. Like once you if you can get your if you can get your hands on the on the on the source files, which I'm not going to. I'm not going to technically say, but there are ways that you can get your hands on those source files, um, and like they're, they're and like they're 
pretty pretty well integrated. Um, so there's a whole segment up here. Um, there's a section. Uh, what's it like? Like the last OMAP chips were around 2013. So the um, it it was basically like Snapdragon before. So like it's uh it, it, it's an old standard but it's a goodie um and like the last omap chips were released around 2013 these are i think omap 4s or omap 5s they're like they're like relatively late on in the uh in, in the process um uh, they've been used in a couple of different places like beagle board and panda boards have both used them in the past they're, they're pretty well they're well understood chips they're capable they have good graphics processes and they're capable of running linux so we then do a bit further digging. I managed to dig out the bootloader, and we go, "Hey, um, okay, well, like, what's it? What, what, what is actually running on these things? Well, they're running Recon OS, which is a custom version of Android. Um, it has a little custom user interface. It's it's cute. It's got all kinds of little little fun things running around inside it, um, and it has a, a basic SDK, uh, which is nice. Um, it's running on." Android 4.1.2, which is just like it can clock roughly up to a gigahertz. Um, we can figure all of this out by taking a look at like the markings on the outsides of the chips, for example. Um, and if we if we start to dig again, if we if we take some of this apart, um, and, and in this case, I'm specifically. Um, activity uh, and we go hey okay like what's what's going on here uh, and it goes like yeah okay so here's how you here's how you update the firmware there's a few uh, a few different dialogues that it can potentially show ranging from like hey there's an update available to you are on low battery and we can't update um there's a firmware update file observe so at least at the time a a, a desktop based update uh, which was interesting uh, and we did a little bit of digging into that and what i discovered is the way the updates work is, is pretty simple there's two separate types of updates there are map updates and there are like cache updates so there's like the actual like maps of like like the skiing maps themselves um which is one data set and then there is the like cache data sets for um like the actual like not just the geolocation data but also like the apps themselves which are updated from a separate binary and then the actual like system itself um so the way that this then effectively ends up working in practice is that the um is that you can effectively go hey um i just want to update the apps and then it will just it, then if, if you just want an update that only updates the apps themselves you can just send one of those binaries and then it will go, hey, you've only got this one. Um, and all of this is managed through that, that multi-update JSON file that you can see there. Um, the resource info.db, is, I think is actually a SQLite file, um, is pretty it's pretty well integrated. It's a uh, it's a pretty a pretty in-depth um, pretty in-depth set of stuff. Um, it's got details on, at least for the time, quite a lot of um quite a lot of stuff um ranging from i mean i mean ranging across the board pretty much it was uh it has like it's it's a very comprehensive database of skiing um for that era um and what and what that allows for um Is a, is, is a few different things, but like mainly what it what it what it means is that we can like go through and like update individual. It, it, we we can build our own versions of these files effectively, so we can do our own fun updates. Um, so where I ended up getting to um, was that I started to to build out um, a chunk of that, um, and so we ended up in this this fun situation where. Um, 
I was like slowly like reverse engineering segments of the of the hardware and then slowly building up um some associated firmware and then like constantly it was this weird sort of like push and pull thing. Um where there where there's lots of like slowly trying to figure out how um so they're trying to figure out how um, how these things end up working in practice. Um, so uh, so what we had in the end is basically um, what what I ended up with roughly um, um, is that it effectively uh, effectively allows us to. Um, <laughs> effectively allows us to build out some um, some hardware that we can then use some software that is that we can then use to expand uh, the functionality of the things so what we ended up doing in, in in this case and it's still very early days i'm still working on this on and off um and and the, and the biggest difficulty of anything is is the age of it because it's such old firmware that it becomes very it's very, very tricky to um, to sort of pull all the individual pieces together. But what we were able to do in the end was um, to build out a chunk of um, a chunk of firmware that allowed us effectively to uh, reconstitute some of the early um, some of the early communication um, in the application itself. Um, so we had this idea of like, okay, right, we have this like, like some some fundamentals here of like, okay, here's how, here's how this is gonna work. Here's these here's these pieces of the puzzle, um, in terms of like, okay, well we've we've got like these these fundamental bits of like this is what works within the system already, and this is what doesn't, um. Like, it, like, like as an example, it's like like community. Like, it would it would immediately block when you when you logged in, when you logged into it, it would immediately end up blocked in some form or another on account of uh, the fact that it, it knew it couldn't talk anymore to its um, that it it couldn't talk to its underlying um, like APIs. So we know that that was pretty. Uh, and we, we know that that at least was pretty limiting at that point. Um, so there was like a whole bunch of fundamentals there where we were like, hey, this 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 just this just ain't it. Like this is there's clearly something very wrong here, but we need to like patch it together. So we built a little application to basically drop in um, that you could push via the update.bin that would then unlock that. Um, so that it would effectively jump straight from that like, hey, the API isn't available view straight into the main applications themselves um uh, which is uh which is very uh very intriguing um so that that, that tended to work pretty well um I was, I was i was quite excited by it myself at least when it when it first started to come out um because it was it, it was intriguing like there was a there was an element of like okay cool we're gonna uh like, 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 we're actually going to do this. Like, you, like you can, you, you can take this thing, um, that, that conventionally would have just been like, I mean, it would have been dead. Like, nothing, nothing would have come back from this. Um, and, and we were able to take that and take this, this brand new piece of, uh, of, of hardware, um, and we were able to just make it work, like, like just off the bat, which is like really, really fancy, um. Which, which, which I personally think is, is, is a ton of fun, and uh, I, I I find it really exciting to take something that's like been dead for that long and just bring it bring it completely back to life again. There's something very uh, something very comforting in that. I think that's the uh, that's the biggest thing. Yeah, it's a very uh, it's a very intriguing concept. Okay. I am uh Okay, I need to 
very briefly, we are going to take a, a brief break just so that I can uh, sort out a little something that's just happening behind camera, and then I will be right back with you folks. engineering story for the evening before we, uh, before we kick off. Uh, this is a fun one. This is one about model trains. Um, this is this is a bit of a bit of reverse engineering, a bit of uh, a bit of just straight engineering. So this hopefully will be a little bit of fun just to round things off for the evening. Um, so model trains. These are uh, little either electric or steam powered locomotives that are designed mainly for fun. Um, but they are 
they're, they're pretty capable. Like they're, they're, they use a lot of different contexts. You usually like leisure, but um, in a lot of cases, they run like full fledged railways. They have all the same safety problems, same kinds of mechanisms involved. It's, 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 a, it's a whole like there's a lot of, of like structural fundamentals that you have to deal with for things like this. But it's the there's a lot of important things that like running a, a local like this. Um, a lot of people build them in their back garden, so like, they're small enough you can kind of have a, have a little bit of fun with it, you know? Um, this uh, is actually a photo of, a, uh, of one near me, which is uh, I've seen many, many times as a child. It's uh, rather quaint. So here's like a rough, a rough idea of, of what we're going to be building here. So this is, this is reverse engineering an existing train uh, signaling system. Um, in order to uh, build our own for model scale. Uh, so this is roughly how they work. So uh, this is a, a diagram I've got, and I think in the um, And this talks about how, like, like basically the block system. So the idea is that the like, train track is segmented into blocks, which are the sections between each set of signals. Um, and within each one of those, there's also a little section of overlap. Um, between one block and the other, so there's like a little buffer zone. Um, and the idea of, of this is, is quite simple, is that like, if you've got a train that is um, still in this block, like if it's in block 123, um, it knows that there's nothing in block 121, so that signal is green, but because this train has not yet entered block 121, because it's still in the little overlap section, this signal here is red, which means that this train is not allowed to travel through to the next section until that train has now cleared that little buffer zone and actually made it fully into the next block. Uh, so the idea of this is quite simple. It's basically that a train should not be allowed to enter um, a, 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 a prior block until the block ahead of it has been fully cleared of train. Um, the idea is that you basically drastically decrease the chance of something being run into I like got one train running into another train uh, like that that kind of thing like, like there, there, there's, there's a whole bunch of like of stuff that you can uh, that you can do there uh, which is a lot of fun uh, so So there's a whole concept that you can basically apply with there, um, and, and, and basically the idea of this was like we were going to like reverse engineer the existing hardware concept and apply it to a pre-existing um, uh, pre like pre-existing model railway. So the first thing that you need to do is build yourself some of these. Now these are um, well, these are axle counters. Um, and this isn't strictly how you would end up doing it in a model scale, but for the purposes of this, just follow along. Um, so the the idea of this basically is that it counts the number of axles, like the number of wheels that go in to a particular block, and then at the other end, it counts the number of them that go back out again. So the idea is that if you if your train breaks and you like accidentally lose a a carriage or something. Um, the number of axles that came out is going to be less than the number of axles that came in, and then you know, oh, okay, right, well, there's something, something's off here. There's probably something like that's gotten lost in this block. I should probably go and check this. Um, and this, and this is then combined with like both conventional signaling systems and more modern, like computer-based train signaling um, to, to solve for that problem. Um, so. Hardware at a model scale, uh, we're looking at very similar concepts, but scaled down. So we have like Raspberry Pis, uh, a little bit of power of Ethernet because we love that. Um, some very poorly drawn lines on my part. Um, so the idea is that basically we can take this very complicated system, we can reverse engineer the fundamentals of what matters about it, and then we can start to break it down into individual segments. So we have, for example, on train hardware to specifically both control handle control and also signaling to the operator. So we on the train itself, we want to actually say, hey, yeah, like like in a small scale, the train can actually, uh, and this is where like things like TVPT come in, which you get in um, 
like the modern subway systems and some like larger train track systems, especially in Europe, is that like the train knows where it is. And so on that basis, the train can then provide proactive information about the about, about the current state of the signaling system to the driver. So they can say, hey, the next signal ahead of us is red, so we should probably be slowing down right now. Um, we also need hardware for the signals themselves. Um, so the actual like physical, okay, hey, here's your here's your light or here's your little moving arm. That all needs some hardware for it. Uh, we need hardware for counting axles um, because we need to be able to know like what's going on in our point system. Um, in a lot of cases, this uh, in the modern systems this isn't necessarily done by axle counting, at least at the model scale. It's done by because there's so few trains in the in the circuit. It's usually done by a train tripping, like just going into a block. Like there'll be a there'll be an infrared like break line, and then that will then be what trips off the rest of it. And um, that's that's usually pretty common. Um, we then need hardware for the actual actual counting itself. Um, which, which again is like we sort of we touched on that a little earlier, uh, and then we need some hardware for the points. So this is this is specifically like switching. So the ability to take a train and put it onto two different sections of track, that is something that is usually integrated with your signaling system for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, um, safety. Like you don't want a train to be able to accidentally go the wrong way and derail uh, you want you want some kind of signal to automatically set itself to danger when that's the case so that you don't have people you know, accidentally derailing themselves left right and center um but also because it's just usually easier to deal with all of this when it's in one one cohesive system um and just for fun why don't we we add some microservices to this uh, so we are going to uh, we're going to do our tra our model train signaling with Kubernetes because why not? Um, so this is a, a, a rough layout of how our how our infrastructure could operate reverse engineered from the from the larger scale form. Um, so we've got like each one of these runs a status node microservice, and then each one of these runs a different microservice depending on what it's doing. So. Um, for example, node discovery, like the big signal manager that sits in like a box somewhere in the, like the main control hub. Um, we have like status nodes, um, individual axle counters, um, the in cab stuff, so the actual in cab warnings, for example, um, status nodes, uh, level crossings, and signals uh, all sitting on one as well, because we can potentially have one pie that deals with like a signal that is also next to a level crossing, for example. So that would be that would be handled as just one, one piece of hardware for these purposes. Um, why does all this matter? Well, um, as an example here, and this is a really fun one, I, I love to bring this up. Uh, this was a, I think Austria, um, train signaling system that was built way back in the 70s. And it was all run on 8-bit microcontrollers. Um, and back then trains were smaller and also they didn't have 16-bit microcontrollers. Well, if they did, they were horribly expensive. So. They built this whole thing on 8-bit microcontrollers and then like 20, 30 years later, they suddenly have to put out this notice because what they realized was that if you have a train that has more than 256 wheels, which is pretty common for like modern um, like modern locomotives that are doing a lot of freight traffic, for example, if you have a train that has like more than, more than 256 wheels, you're going to end up in a really fun situation where if you have more than 256 axles on the train, um, the axle counter will basically overflow the integer number and go back to zero again. So you end up with an invisible train. Um, so it goes, so it goes right from being like, yeah, no, there's a train in this in this block to like, oh, what, no train? And the train's gone. Um, so they had to put out this advisory that basically said uh, to avoid falsely signaling a section of track as clear, um, the total number of axles in a train must not equal 256. So you can never build a train with 256 axles. You must have either below 256 or 257 or above. It can't, it can't be that number because then it just makes it disappear. Um, which is which is really quite something. I mean, I, I, I never thought I'd see that particular note in my life, uh, which is really quite fun. Um, cool. So that is that is pretty much the, uh, the end of this particular session. We are going to be uh, doing some real fun hands-on um, 
reverse engineering with hardware in the next couple of ones on uh let me check dates uh next session is going to be on saturday and then we're also doing another session on sunday uh definitely walk up for those because we're going to be taking basically all of the concepts that i've explained today and we're going to be applying them to a couple of really fun projects doing a bit of poking around some pcbs we're going to be talking through all of that chatting our way through things it's going to be a wild time um are there any any hardware related questions um feel free to throw them my way now i'll be sticking around for another couple of minutes and then we'll uh, we'll shuffle our way off Oh, we're also, uh, the uh, the stuff we're going to be talking about then is we're going to we're going to talk about the we're going to talk a little bit about the Disney Magic Band, um, but then we're also going to try and hack my toothbrush. That is the that is the current plan. We are going to be hacking both the toothbrush and the way my toothbrush charges because I would like my toothbrush to be able to charge over USB C, um, because I like that. I think that's an effective uh, an effective thing, especially for travel. Um, and uh, because I have US, I have a European toothbrush, it only has the European charging plug on it. So we're gonna we're gonna see if we can't do a little bit of fun there. Uh, so I think it's inductive charging, but I don't know yet. So we're gonna tear down the charging block and, and see what we can get at. Have a little bit of fun. Wonderful. It looks like we don't have any questions. So thank you, folks, very very much for joining me. I do hope that you have uh, learned some wonderful things off of this. Uh, session and please do join me for the next couple when we uh, get nice and hands-on oh hang on one question I'll, I will catch this before i go uh making it as an embedded security engineer um what skills or certifications did the industry require how much does it pay um entire so pay is very dependent on experience um it's also very dependent on what area of the industry you're working in like Automotive security is very hot right now, so they're paying the big bucks. Um, if you're working on like just straight embedded stuff, it can usually be similar to like electrical engineering pay. Um, certifications wise, a lot of it is pretty similar to your conventional um, like cybersecurity qualifications. I know that there are a couple that are specific to hardware, but I think the main thing is having a good grounding in cybersecurity and then having a good grounding in electrical engineering. Like if you've got if you've got electrical engineering qualifications and then go and do some cybersecurity stuff, then you're going to be in a really good place. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you, folks, very, very much. Uh, and I will see you all on Saturday. Happy Global Hack Week.